Um, but you'll very quickly see that that is a whole different ball game than, oh, there might be a fight. Let me get my knife out. Oh, yeah. Welcome to Uncensored Tactical, where our goal is to talk about training, tactics, and more without being limited by red tape or a sterile bureaucratic environment so that we can bring you value and insight in a way that other organizations just plain can't. Okay, we're live. Uh, so let's do a really short housekeeping up front. I wonder if you can hear Arrow doing her heavy breathing in the background and a Texas teen in the other room playing Fortnite and screaming his head off. So not complaining, just letting you know that you might hear some stuff in the background. Uh, disclaimer, it's going to be some adult language and some adult content as per usual. Uh, next, now that I have more time to dedicate to Uncensored Tactical and to dedicate to Patreon, you guys asked on a recent poll, and I'm here to deliver. So today we're doing mini daily tactical drills for busy but prepared people. Um, during the show, I like to give my, uh, my contact info out in the beginning and the end of the show. I don't always do it every time, but I try really hard. So easiest two ways to find me. Number one, I'm really active on Instagram. And that's at Uncensored Tactical. You can also follow my canine page, which is the letter K, the number nine, Academy, underscore TX. Uh, so I have those two accounts. You can just ping me on there or just go straight to my email inbox. And the new email that we're using is really simple, really short. It's pat at U-T-A-C dot I-O. And that's also the shortcut for the website. If you like U-T-A-C dot I-O will bring you right to uncensoredtactical.com. Last piece of housekeeping, and then we're going to do a little bit more housekeeping at the end of the show. It is now July in 2021, and I'm pretty sure my December entry and escape course over at the Tees facility in by Holly in Mississippi is about halfway filled up. So consider getting yourself an early Christmas gift for this coming holiday season uh, or whatever thing you celebrate or don't. Uh, I would... I mean, seriously, the earlier you get signed up for that, the better. It is going to be phenomenal. I'm going to have one or maybe two assistant instructors with me. It is a fantastic instructor to student ratio. We're going to be learning a lot. The facility's great. The people that run tees, they're awesome. So head over to uncensoredtactical.com backslash courses. That'll take you to our course signup pages. Or you can just go straight to energeticentry.com because they're, they're processing the payment for this course because they're hosting me. So that is our update. Let's get into the show. So, uh, today I have the last few sips of my coffee in front of me, and then I have a brand new cold monster and a nice koozie that I'll be drinking. No alcohol, because it's about noon here in Texas, and it's a little too early for me to be do doing some day drinking, and honestly, still, my same, my same lifestyle choices apply. Uh, I hardly ever drink unless it's recording a podcast, and even then, I don't, I'm doing a lot less of that, too. So the overview, it is a fucking pain in the ass to set up training. Uh, and people are fucking busy, especially after our latest round of tyranny from our overlords, shutting down thousands of small businesses and demanding that huge companies lay off millions of employees. Uh, so it's tough. It's busy. People are hustling. People are struggling. I get it. So there are some things that you can do to keep your edge sharp that doesn't require an outline, gear prep, travel, coordination with other people, gas, hotel, four to eight hours of uninter uninterrupted time, cleanup, etc. So we are going to talk about some of those mini tactical training sessions that you can do um, and how we can get that. Hopefully by the end of the episode, you'll get your brain muscle flexing and you'll think of other ideas. Uh, I only have about five or six here. Um, but I would love to hear your thoughts at the end of this episode too. So occasionally I, I ask for feedback from the audience and sometimes that's been hard to track in the past because I've been working a full-time job and with my spare time, I'm trying to keep up with everything. So now I have a lot more time to dedicate to this. So if you're listening to this and you go, Oh, I got an idea or something that you do or something you want to do. That's a small mini tactical idea. I would love for you to get that to me ASAP and I'll try and fill it into the website page um, for the source article for this episode. And this one's going to be 170, episode 170, closing in on 200. All right. Number one, if you're a longtime listener, uh, you've heard this before. This is the bump bag. So you can go as in-depth or not as you like, but even if, you're, even if you're putting a lot of money and a lot of gear into the bag, still try and keep it simple. Hold on one second. Good plots. Relax. We're trying to, good, we're trying to focus on uh, arrow. 
in the background here. So this week we're focusing on Fooey that, relax. We're trying to get her to enjoy lots of time being calm. So she's in the background there making some noise. Okay, so bump bag. No matter how much money you want to put into your bag or how much different gear you want to put in there, it should still be a simple system. So at a minimum, I, I put on my shoes, I put on my underwear and my socks, I put on a pair of pants, I put on a pair of boots. Uh, if you want, you can strap a gun belt around your normal belt and your normal pants. And if you want, you can add upper body armor to that too. If you want, you could add a fucking helmet to that too or nods, whatever, right? So here's the process. You're wearing all that stuff now and you step into a, I don't know, it's like a foot and a half by two foot or roughly two foot by two foot uh, big canvas parachute bag. You can get them on Amazon for pretty cheap. So you step into that bag. Then you undo your belt, your gun belt and your regular belt. You unzip your pants and you roll your pants all the way down by your ankles while you're standing in your boots and you're standing in that bag. You untie your boots nice and loose. You, and then you take your, you, you uh, take your feet out of the boots. And what you're left with is uh, what firefighters call like their bunker gear setup. So you have two boots sticking up through your rolled up pants. So at this point, if you just stop, right, and you put that bag to the side, when you're ready, all you do is step in your boots, pull your pants up, click your belt, and now you have boots, pants, and a gun belt. Um, you can also take your body armor and put it on top of your boots so that if you wake up in the middle of the night, now you, you go over to your bag, maybe you unzip it, maybe it's already unzipped. Um, maybe it's under a bed and you pull it out of the bed, or maybe it's just by the foot of your bed, depending on your living situation. So now with the armor, it would be step one. Um, and I leave one side of my armor unattached and the other side I leave attached if that makes sense so um, if I'm wearing my armor I would unclip my left cumber band and I would take both shoulder straps up and over my head so when I put it on it's the same thing it's it's not like putting on a t-shirt it's like putting on half of a t-shirt and then all I have to do is connect one side so that's pretty quick so this step <clears throat> this process would be wake up out of the middle of the night because something goes bump and I've determined I do have enough time to put on my kit so I'll throw the kit over my head, I Velcro one side shut, that takes all of five seconds, maybe, to get out of bed and into my uppers, my upper armor. Then I step into my boots, I pull my pants up, I click my belt, now I have my upper armor, my gun belt, a secure belt system, I have pants and I have boots that are at this point untied. I don't even need to zip up my pants at this point. Um, and if you keep a pistol on a holster on your belt, on your pants and your bump bag, again, depending on your living situation, if you're single or if you don't have any children in the house, um, you can, it's a lot easier to justify keeping a loaded handgun in a holster on a belt, in a bag on the floor of your bedroom. Um, so for me, that's the, that's the process. Um, so you pull your pants up, click, click your gun belt and then boom, you're ready to rock. This is so much better in so many more environments whether it's extra hot, extra cold, um, if it's extra hot out and you happen to need this during the middle of the day, it's so much better to have coverage on your feet than to burn your fucking feet off. If it's freezing outside and there's snow on the ground, yes, if, in some cases, if there's an immediate emergency and you have to go out your front door, it might be better just to rush right out of that front door with a rifle and your underwear and nothing else. Maybe. It would be much better if you had that extra five to ten seconds to, to cover your little toesies, right? So you get to make those decisions uh, and you can go in depth as, as you like with that. Um, and I'd love to hear your feedback. Uh, I have heard a little bit of feedback from people. Um, I'd love some photos too. If you guys got some bump bags set up, I would love to see that. So send that in to pat at utac.io. That's my email. Cool. So that's the drill, right? After you've set this up initially, how long does it take to run this mini drill? You can do it. You just snap your fingers and go, you know what? Let's run that drill. And you don't even need to sprint. Just walk into your bedroom, step into your shoes, pull up your pants, clip your belt. If your armor's there, put your armor on your head, pick up a rifle or a pistol, and take a step back out of your bedroom. That process should take you less than 60 seconds. And the cool thing is, the cleanup should take you less than 60 seconds, right? You get back, you step in your bag, you roll your pants down, take your uppers off. Um, I love that and I'll probably use that system till the day I die I fucking love it um, let's not beat that horse to death because I have covered that a few times on the show take a little sip of the last bit of my coffee I'm going to praise my dog because she's being still give me one second
going to crack open a monster. And drill number two. I probably won't spend a lot of time on this. It's not my specialty, but ooh, that relax, plus. Very good, good girl, relax. Uh, it's not my specialty, but I know some people that it is their specialty. So I'm going to give you some stuff. Excuse me. To get you started. Here's the the concept. Drill number two is communications drills. Overview is nowadays most people, especially in the U.S. Most people have dozens of different methods and platforms and avenues with which to communicate with their friends and family circles all over the country and the world, including their immediate family, right? So the people in your same house, you probably have 10 different ways to get a hold of them through your phone to their phone. And if we include laptops, computers, okay, you have like a dozen different ways, but it's all through a phone and through wireless or through Bluetooth or through cell signal, right? Uh, so this isn't tactics as in the shootout, but this is a, a tactic or a way or a method um, and a system through which you can communicate during an emergency. So what happens when just Wi-Fi goes out? Well, probably nothing. You probably have cell service. And even if you have to use a laptop, you can just tether the two of those together, right? What happens if just cell service goes out and you have Wi-Fi? You're probably pretty good. Uh, what happens if both go out, right? Or what if you, uh, like, just like today, I had a, a small emergency on the farm that I had to handle. And what if, um, I took care of it just fine, but what if it was something I couldn't handle and we did have the power go out twice in the last two days on the farm? So what if power went out when I was sleeping, woke up to an emergency and my phone's dead or the internet hasn't restarted and there's not very good signal out here, right? What the hell do I do? So... I've kind of beaten that horse to death too. So the, the point is there is a huge reliance on the electronic platform in your pocket. Let's start thinking about ways that we can communicate outside of that. So at a minimum in that, if you're trying to get a hold of somebody, you can obviously, you can text them, you can hit them on social media. And I really like the email option as a tertiary, right? So if you have a phone call and text, those are kind of one social media is pretty much a close second because that, that's Wi-Fi and uh, cell service. And then email, I really like, because a lot of people that either have a desktop or a laptop computer somewhere in the house. So if you're outside the house and you have a problem, maybe your your landline internet connection still works in your home. So email is a really good uh, option for that. Outside of that, I know nothing about radios, but there's some really cool people in my Discord um, that know a lot about radio communication. Um, and we're still tentatively open for that. If you want to jump into our really nice but small community with tons of value and uh, tons of camaraderie, lots of love, lots of cool ideas, lots of tactics, lots of sharing. We have people from all over the world in there, but it's still small enough that everyone knows who everyone is. Uh, I share a Discord with Insurgency Knitting Circle. So if you check out IKC Podcast on Subscribestar, if you give them the $2 level of support, that will allow you access into their Discord, which is also my discord cool uh radio is a great option but that for the most part relies on batteries unless you have something handheld uh, i mean <laughs> i'm sorry uh the grid being up unless you have something on handheld which is battery powered the coolest thing i wanted to talk about here which is not super duper tactical but i really like it um and i really want to promote that a lot more is write a fucking letter with pen and a piece of paper and fold that shit up and memorize or have an address an address book in paper that's not digital that you can put the address on the front of the envelope pop a stamp on there put your letter in the envelope seal it shut and drop that thing in an outgoing mail somewhere uh, this is a fantastic avenue for emergency communication but it has a really slow lag time so this is more this is not such an such a big issue for something like hey i'm out of gas i'm late for work uh, I can't get a hold of my wife because she's at work. Let me mail her a letter. Obviously a dumb fucking idea, right? But, oh my God, there's a regional disaster going on. I have family or friends or a support circle somewhere either within or outside this region. Um, I have a plan to take me and my loved ones somewhere. And I want to make sure that my, um, my circle can get a hold of me. That is a great time. If you have the time to write a letter and drop it in outgoing mail, 
there's even a chance that your house goes down, but your mailbox is still standing, right? Whether it's a fire or a hurricane, tornado. So if you leave town, um, at some point, if your mailbox is still standing, at some point, mail is going to resume and that message can get out whether you have cell service, Wi-Fi or not. And if you want to go a step deeper, this is a pretty cool way to communicate with other people using code, right? Uh, so some people in our community are, are doing a Morse code training with one another. So they're learning how to do, uh, they have drills that they do every day and they post updates back and forth to each other with photos of code sheets that they got the right or the wrong answers on uh, for listening to Morse code. Uh, this is also great. For, oh God, what's the right term? It's not cryptography, right? Not cartography. That's from apps. Cryptography, right? Um, don't butcher me if I'm using the wrong word, but uh, for encoding messages. I think that's, I fucking have such a boner for that. I think that's so cool. I've done just a little bit of it. I want to do a lot more of it. And I certainly am going to do more of that. So you'll see more content on that coming out in the future. But as far as comms go, have some options. Uh, and again, radio is a great option. Even if you don't have super duper CB radio skills, uh, and depending on your family situation and how far you are from work or your support circle, even tiny little handheld radios that you can get to put those AA batteries in, that might be a really good option. Um, and a mini drill would be, hey, while, it, while you're at work today, around noon, I'll be at home, you'll be at work, we'll see if our walkie-talkies can go back and forth. So just set a timer on your watch, turn the walkie-talkie on, we'll see if it works, cool. Uh, and that drill costs almost nothing, takes almost no time to set up, there's no cleanup, there's no gear maintenance, super easy. Um, so that's the kind of mindset we wanna get into. Take a drink. I know some of this seems a little basic, but sometimes we need reminders of basic. All right, cool. Moving on. Another one similarly related to power outages. This one's a little different speed here. This is not super tactical, but it is uh, lifestyle and preparedness related. So I, when I was active in the service and I lived in a bunch of, I moved around all the time. I used to try and figure out how I was going to manage my, one second. It's okay. Relax. Plus. Very good, good plots, good relax, good girl. Uh, so when I moved around in the military, I used to try and figure out, fooey that, plots, relax. I used to try and figure out how I'm gonna manage my resources uh, if the power goes out. And living in Florida, that is something that's very reasonable for you to try and figure out, because that's Hurricane Alley. Uh, so you are not a crazy person for figuring out how you're going to manage your resources. It was really common when hurricanes rolled through to be out without power for one day, two, two whole days, three days. Um, I think we went four or five days when I was a kid, uh, either in high school or just out of high school. I know we had a week with no power and, uh, I think we had some plumbing issues too. So for drill number three, this one is really enjoyable. Um, but it's also getting your brain in that right, uh, getting your brain in the right pattern to start to understand the things that we can do regularly that don't take a lot of time can still benefit us in an emergency. So this one is what I call power out coffee. So a lot of people are in a hurry in the mornings. So maybe do this on the weekend and make it something that you can enjoy. So what I'm going to do here, and I'm probably going to take a video of it for you guys soon is get some whole coffee beans. I'm going to get a hand coffee grinder, which I don't have yet. I've been looking at some for the last couple months, getting OCD on YouTube, trying to see hand coffee grinder reviews. So get yourself some whole beans and this is with no power. So you grind up your beans in your hand grinder, you get your filter, um, you get whatever type of coffee system you want that you can work without power. So there's a lot, a lot of options. I've used two that I really like. One is the, uh, Biatelli mocha cups. It looks like a, like a steel hourglass shape and it unscrews in the middle. So, so that will make your, I think espresso. Um, and then you have your, uh, your pour over or drip coffee. So I had a Chemex that I really liked. So I'll put my filter in that. I'll put my coffee beans in and for the water, I'll be taking a pot and I'll put the right amount of water in and I'll put that pot on like a small camping stove. So this will all be done outside on the porch, wake up, bring all your stuff out. And with no power, you're going to go from start to finish and you're going to enjoy a sweet ass handmade, no power required cup of coffee. So, oh my God, that's crazy tactical smart. No, no, it's not. 
<laughs> but it is something you could do in an emergency. And an emergency doesn't have to be the end of the world. An emergency can be, I forgot my credit card, I forgot my money, or I'm out at the shooting range and I left my coffee at home. So if you're at an outdoor shooting range and you're jonesing for your coffee and you're enjoying your whole day that you planned out for yourself and your boys or whoever, um, it's really fucking cool to be mobile, to be non, like non on grid and to make yourself a really cool cup of coffee. I saw this from a, a buddy of mine, uh, who's a designated marksman at my drug unit, really cool cat. And I just, I thought it was the coolest fucking thing that we showed up to a picnic and he breaks out this little camping stove, gets a little filter out. And I think at the time he had a French press and he heats up a fucking thing of water. He grinds some beans. He pours them in the thing. He pushes the thing around, pours it into a coffee cup, and he's just drinking hot ass fresh coffee. And I know it sounds funny. And I, I wonder if any of you guys out there are rolling your eyes at me, but it was just so fucking cool. Like my whole life I grew up and it was either someone makes your coffee for you and you pay them like Starbucks or you make your coffee at home by flipping a switch. Anyways, I'm going to get off this, uh, <laughs> I'm going to get off this episode, uh, off that drill, but, but I enjoyed that. So if you end up doing that, shoot me a, a message on Instagram. If you're on there, I would love to see how that works out for you. Okay. Back into super duper tactical, right? This is, oh my God, we're in combat. Thanks for bearing with me. So, depending on the knife style, we're going to talk uh, combative knife fighting here. And this is just one portion of that and one thing that you can do, even by yourself, to keep your tactical edge sharp. And speaking of edges, our last episode we did, 169, was with Brad. And we talked about sharpening knives with water stones. I really enjoyed that, and we're going to have Brad back on for a part two. Uh, so maybe check that one out if you haven't yet. So, combative knife fighting. This is drill number four. Some people carry knives that have these... Uh, uh, draw opening devices on them. So as you draw the knife out, sorry about that. As you draw the knife out, it opens on its own. Uh, it's pretty cool if it's reliable and if it's a good system. So some people, as they pull the knife out, that happens for them. The blade's out, the knife's in their hand, they're good to go. I would venture to say most people aren't like that. And even if you had that device, it might not work. So here's the drill back into core tactics. Ready? If you're going to take your knife out of your pocket and if you're by yourself, because I don't recommend doing this in front of your coworkers or even sometimes in front of your family or friends, cause you might look like a psycho. If you're by yourself and you look around and you're like, I'm the only person in this big vanilla room, no one else but me put one hand out and push against the wall and then chop your feet. Like, you know, when uh, sports players like they do the left, right, left, right, left, right, just lift your knees up real quick. So, push against the wall with one hand, chop your feet like you're trying to push and run and knock that wall over. So you're keeping your hand against the wall. And with your other hand, while your ass is shaking and your feet are pumping left and right, try and get that knife out. Be smart, be safe, don't fucking cut yourself, please. Um, but you'll very quickly see that that is a whole different ball game than, oh, there might be a fight, let me get my knife out. Oh yeah, let me grab it, pull it out of the pocket, flip it open, man, I'm so cool, look how that flipped open. Whole different fucking ball game. Um, and you have to understand, walls don't fight back. So it's really just in motion, pulling your knife out. Uh, and of course you can do the same thing with your weapons. So doing reloads while you're walking, reloads while you're running, reloads while you're sitting. Those are all things you can really quickly add into your daily schedule if you're by yourself, if you're in a safe direction, if you have a safe weapon. Uh, so those are things to keep in mind. So that's the one hand knife opening while you're pumping your feet and moving your hips and trying to push something, uh, trying to get that knife out safely and quickly. Cool. That was a short one. Drill number five. Uh, I'm pretty sure I have mentioned this before. Uh, this is what I call driver down drills. I learned these back in 2000, late 2008, I think. And this was with, uh, this is when Blackwater was still called Blackwater. Uh, so the drills are called driver down drills. And there's two main ways that this would apply. Number one, you need to take control of a vehicle from the passenger side. Uh, so you're deciding to take down the driver. So you, you incapacitate, 
incapacitate them, you kill them, you push them out of the car, you whatever, pick a thing. So it's combat related, like, or the driver gets shot and you're in the passenger seat. Or the other one, which I really like, which also applies to your practical world, not just your tactical world, is the person in the driver's seat has a fucking heart attack or a stroke or a seizure. So from the passenger seat, you need to take control of the car. Uh, a really easy way to integrate this into your life, especially if you have family, is um, how common is it that you're in the passenger seat or the driver's seat and one of the two of you in your whatever your family unit, friends unit is, where you say the phrase, hey, grab the wheel for a second. I have to do this thing. One thing or another, whatever it is. Uh, really common, right? So now instead of doing that common thing and going, well, I guess I'll just grab the wheel, you make that the drill. So it's, hey, grab the wheel, and then boom, the drill starts. Now, of course, you have to do this safely. Very fond of crawl, walk, run. I am not a big fan of tactical surprises for training, uh, and there is a very smart, reasonable way to smartly structure a surprise while people are still prepared for that surprise. So there's ways to do that. So I do not like the, you know, grab my wrist, grab my wrist, you know, other wrist, other way, break the wrist, walk away. I think that's fucking stupid. But there are ways you can say, um, which we're going to get into later. Uh, no, we'll, we'll talk about it in the lens of this drill. So there are ways to say, we're starting very slow. The car is parked. The car is not even turned on. I'm in the driver's seat. You're in the passenger seat or vice versa. Let, let us walk through this drill together in park. In private, okay. Step one, the passenger puts their, in the US, they put their left hand on the 12 o'clock position of the steering wheel with their palm facing down. So you're grabbing from up and you're slapping down onto the steering wheel and grabbing it. The reason you don't grab it underneath or with your palm facing up, and you can try this in real life or you can try this imaginary, I think you'll find the same results. If you're in the right, oh man, sorry. If you're in the right seat of a car and the driver wheel is on the left, if you reach with the top of your hand to the top of the wheel, palm facing down, and you want to turn the car to the right, it's easy. You just bring your fist to the right to the 3 o'clock and the car turns right. If you want to turn to the left, it's easy. You go back to the top, 12 o'clock, and then continue counterclockwise over to the 9 o'clock and your car turns left. Try this with your palm up, grabbing 12 o'clock on the steering wheel. So towards you is easy. You do like you're doing a curl, right? You just pull and the car turns to the right. Now, what about going to the left? You go back up to 12 and then your arm doesn't rotate past that 12 o'clock or maybe even 11 o'clock. So if you switch your hand over to an overhand grip, it's way easier to roll that wheel all the way to the left. Okay. Again, I'm going to do a, a full episode on vehicles and driving in the future, but Step one, you're in the passenger seat, driver goes down, or you take them down, or they get killed, or they have a medical condition, whatever. You reach out, the first thing, you reach over and grab that wheel, palm down at the 12 o'clock position, while you keep your eyes on the road. So from here on out in the drill, you will always be keeping your eyes on the road, and you will always be maintaining steering. And honestly, it's better to have control of steering than it is the gas and the brake, because at least if you're going to crash into an obstacle, you can choose where or when that happens or to what degree or what angle. We're going to get you to get your foot on that gas and brake pedal in a second. But your focus is stay between the left and right lines. We're assuming that we're in traffic um, and maintain control of the wheel. Eyes on the road, control the wheel. Eyes on the road, control the wheel. Okay. Step number two. You're going to use your right hand. You're going to touch your chest and your belly area. You're going to scoop up into the seatbelt, so the seatbelt, so your arm is between the seatbelt and your chest, and you're going to use the seatbelt on the back of your arm and the back of your hand as a guide, so that with your eyes closed or with your eye, no, with your eyes on the road, and if you can imagine, even without looking, is what I meant, you can slide down. You can feel that seatbelt guide your hand down to the seatbelt release button, and the really nice thing about having your hand between your body and the seatbelt is that once you click that button, you just push your hand forward and the whole seatbelt goes forward and away from your chest and then retracts. This is big for when you have gear on. Let's say you have a taser or magazines or slings or helmets or things hanging off your neck. If you reach down normally, like a normal person would, right? So your right hand is floating out in front of you in space. You're in the passenger seat. You reach from your, you know, from like the glove box area straight down to the seatbelt release and then you release it, 
Now your arm is stuck in the seatbelt and that seatbelt is gonna pull tight against your body and it's gonna get caught on whatever is attached to your chest. So the first step is you push that seatbelt, push your hand between the seatbelt and your body and you kind of push the seatbelt away. Then you slide your arm down and automatically that seatbelt goes out into space and away from your chest rig as it retracts. Lots of talking here. I know it's, uh, this would be a great video. Let's do that soon. Uh, noted. So step one, palm down 12 o'clock in the steering wheel. Step two, arm between your body and the, and the seatbelt. While your eyes are staying on the road, you're going to send your hand down to the seatbelt release button and pop that away. Number three, let's see, give me a second here. I haven't done this well. One, two, okay. Number three is, uh, depending on the type of car and the type of uh, seat setup, you're going to try and get your left foot up and over that center console, if there is one, and in most cars there is one, and you're going to try and wedge your foot between the center console and a driver's right leg. So you're gonna, you might have to fish your toes around a little bit, and you might have to use your free hand to move the driver's right leg to the left a little bit. So you make a little hole and you get your foot in there. You don't have to hit the pedals yet if you can't reach them. That's not a big deal because step four, once you get your leg over, is you're going to use your right hand and push against the door, um, or you're going to grab the oh shit bar above your head or whatever. Use your elbow to prop, but you're going to get your body and you're going to kind of Spider Man so that your you know your legs are straddling. Ooh, that plus relax, good girl. So that you're straddling the center console of the car and you're pushing your left shoulder up against the driver. And this is really nice if there's a medical emergency too, because you're you're hopefully going to be able to keep their airway open if you do this the right way. But you're going to you're going to barricade that driver back and left against the driver door with your left shoulder. And if you have to adjust your feet or your arms, you're going to kind of put like 60, 70 percent of your body into that driver's area. So now that you're in that area, you're controlling the car with your left hand. Your eyes have stayed on the road the whole time. Your seatbelt's off. The driver's pushed up against the driver door. Now you can use that free right hand and you can adjust those feet a little bit if the driver's unconscious and you can scoop those feet away. And now you get your left foot um, near those gas and brake pedals. And then I'd like to do a quick brake check, make sure the car slows down, a quick gas check, make sure the car speeds up. And this is to ensure that the driver's foot isn't still impeding your braking or driving ability. And then we're off, right? So whether we need to get out of the area in a speedy way, we can do that. Or whether we need to slow the car down to a stop safely without crashing, we can do that. That's the driver down drill. The crawl version is we do it with the car turned off in park, you know, without moving. With everybody being aware of what's happening, we take our time, we explain the steps, and we rep it over and over and over. The crawl would be on a very private, probably very rural road that's very safe with not a lot of turns, it's very straight, it's well lit, there's no one in sight. We're idling and we do the same thing. You're gonna wanna be aware of not kicking that stick shift, um, or not a, not a lot of cars have those now, uh, not kicking that uh, shifter. You're gonna, gonna wanna be aware of keeping your eyes on the road the whole time, that's really difficult for a lot of people. Um, what you can do if you have multiple people in the car, they can help you with that. You can even do a rotation. Uh, I used to do this. Uh, I practiced this quite a bit with some uh, military buddies of mine. The driver would go, driver down, and they'd pass out. So the passenger would grab the wheel, undo the seatbelt, get the leg over, push his body up over that console, move the driver legs, gas check, brake check, then we'd start driving. And then the person in the back seat uh, would reach up and they'd pull the driver uh, seat recline button and they'd have that driver's seat roll back. They would pull the unconscious driver into the back seat. They would do CPR or whatever medical process they had to. Uh, and then the person from original passenger seat would be fully into the driver's seat. They would raise the seat up and you'd keep driving. And then we rotate. So one of the people from the back crawls to the front and then a new driver down drill starts and you can just loop that. Again, the crawl would be, would be parked, car off, uh, the walk would be, I think I said the wrong phrase earlier. The walk would be on a slow, straight, well-lit road with nobody around. Uh, and the run would be up to you, right? Be very smart, be very safe, uh, don't be an idiot. So maybe on a track somewhere would be a good place to practice that run. Cool, we went long on that, but I think that one was the most tactical yet. Whew. 
<clears throat> Let's see, we got six, seven, eight. I'll move through these kind of quick. I think we're going long format today. today. Six, these are pretty tactical, pretty combat related as well. And I've done these in my life. Uh, these are what uh, we call open door drills. Again, there's a crawl, walk, run format. We'll try and talk about that a little bit. So assuming all parties are well informed, all parties are healthy, all parties are able to do this, and all parties understand what's going to happen and when. You start with a crawl. So you say, uh, like some, a lot of martial arts programs with the striking, you'll have uh, striking mitts, right? So you, you punch the uh, mitt on someone's hands so it's not direct combat, right? Uh, so one person has training mitts and they're on one side of a closed door. The other person is going to walk up to the door, open the door, and then the training is on. So it's not full out brawl combat. This is just the crawl phase. So you'll both very intentionally say, let's start the drill, close the door. When you open the door, you'll see these pads. That means punch the pads. Boom, 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 boom. Punch the pads 10 times, whatever. Okay. That's your really easy crawl. Then the variables go crazy from there. But let's say we're keeping it with the striking and the punching um, and with the doors. So an example, and these are all up to you. Have fun with it, but be safe and smart. The walk might be, uh, okay, sometime, uh, sometime today, as you and I are both in this house, um, at one point when you go into your bedroom and come back out again, at some point, I'll throw the pads up in your face as soon as you open the door because I'll be standing there, like, ready for you to come out. And then the fight starts. So let's say you go in and out of your room 10 times a day. One of those times, I'll be there with the mitts, and that's it. So it's, again, that's a format we talked about a little bit ago. You can instill a surprise while both parties are still informed. So both parties know along the lines of what that surprise might be within a spectrum. Uh... An example, crawl, walk, run. A run might be, hey, sometime this week, since we've done this drill a bunch in the crawl format, we've done it a little bit in the walk format, now we can relax because I want you to be more surprised when it happens, but I do want your consent and I do want you to be informed. Meaning, you have a lot of time to decompress, so over the next week, you will become desensitized to that drill, you'll become a little bit more relaxed, and you'll think, oh... I forgot all about that drill. I'm in my bedroom now. I'm walking out because we haven't done that drill in so long. Oh, no, there's the pads. So I'm a little bit more surprised now. So it's a little bit more realistic. That's your crawl, your walk, your run, and that's for your timing. So the crawl, walk, run can also be the type of drill that happens when the door opens. Crawl could be with just striking some mitts. Uh, walk could be, um, you know, trying to disarm my knife, which uh, Dan Asanto and I think Bruce Lee, too, said if you aim... <laughs> What is it? Uh, disarm should be uh, accidental, if not in incidental, or something like that. Meaning, don't aim for a disarm, aim for combat. Uh, but you could do drills with weapons, right? Smartly with training weapons. Uh, and your run could be something like, uh, fuck it, with a uh, like a shock knife, right? Like a training knife with that electricity around the edge. Or it could be, we're going to do some striking, and I'm going to grab you, and you know, we're going to do some standing grappling and some mitt punches, something like that. So you get to choose how that goes, uh, but you have to be safe and smart about it because if people get killed during training, that's not good for anybody. Uh, so those are open door drills. Uh, you can also add in some, what, what would you call it? I would call it a uh, false combat indicator, right? So for drills, a lot of times when you surprise people with these shoot or don't shoot drills, the don't shoot is really important. So you put people in an environment where they think, oh God, I'm going into combat, and you get that little buildup in your body of fight or flight. So maybe start the drill one of the rounds with both parties being informed, and you bang on the fucking door, and you're like, hey, hey, hey. And the other party opens the door, and they're expecting the fight, right? Because we've set up training, because we have punching mitts, because we've done several repetitions, they're like, oh God, he's really angry. I'm going to open the door, and the fight is on. And the person is holding their hand, you know, the drill, the person initiating the drill from the far side of the door, the one that banged on the door, and they go, hey, 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 and the door opens, and it's, oh my god, I'm bleeding, I cut my hand open, get me a tourniquet. And you're like, whoa, glad I didn't punch, oh, that was close, I thought we were fighting. And they go, shit, where's the tourniquet at? So then you go get a tourniquet, you apply it to your buddy, you test it, make sure the bleeding has stopped, i.e. you check for a pulse. Um, 
Both parties are informed. Both parties are safe. There's a little bit of a surprise there, but you're helping, you're learning, you're training. And the cool part that fits in with the format of this episode is that doesn't take a lot of time to prepare, doesn't take a lot of time to do, and doesn't take a lot of time to clean up. And it costs almost no money, right? That's the format. So I'm only giving you a couple drills in this, but I want your big sexy brain noodles to be thinking about how can we add more of these into our lives without changing the way we live our we live our lives, right? So this is small dose tactics in mini tactical drills. I've got, let's see, what do we have left? I'll do two more and I'll just go uh, lightning round. Ready? Next one, don't silhouette. So drill number seven, don't silhouette. When you hear something go bump in the night, the drill is lights off because this is your home, right? You live here, you should know your way around pretty well with the lights off or the lights really low. So if something goes bump in the night, you don't want to turn all the lights on and stand in front of your window if you think it's a combat threat, right? If you hear shooting or something outside your house or loud banging, you probably don't want to silhouette yourself and stand right in front of the window. So all the lights off, grab a gun in either order that you think is appropriate or at the same time. Another variable is if you have a partner, um, I used to do this all the time in the last place I lived. So it would be uh, I would be, I would hear something happen and one person would say, I got the lights, you get the gun. And then when I'm gunned up and I'm at the window, the other person would go get their gun. The lights would already be off and we w- wouldn't silhouette. So once you have gun, gun in hand and lights off, now you have to make decisions. And those decisions range anywhere from depending on the type of dwelling you're living in and how many people are involved and what the stimulus is, like what the bump was in the night. It might be do I go to the front door, crack the front door open with my rifle at low ready, and do I peek out and try and cut the pie? Could it be you live pretty rural, so if you're standing in your front door with a rifle, your neighbors won't either A, won't see you, or B, won't think you're crazy? Uh, probably not a great idea in an apartment complex to do a walk around your apartment building with a rifle at night. Probably not the best bet, uh, especially for training. Uh, so these variables are on you. Uh, but that's the don't silhouette drill. So it could be now you add in the variables of how much time do we have? Oh, do I use my bump bag too? go get the bump bag, put on my upper armor and go, or is it, let me just put on my pants and my Glock around my waist because I don't think it's combat. It might be an animal or a car crash or something. Do I go to the front door and peek without a gun in my hand? But either way, I'm collecting Intel. So the lights are off. We don't silhouette. And that's just some examples of the don't silhouette drill. And that takes almost no preparation, almost no money, and almost no time, and almost no cleanup. And it keeps you a little bit sharp. So it's a good idea to do that when there is a bump in the night, rather than, oh, there's a bump in the night. It's probably nothing. Oh, there's a bump in the night. Well, let me just grab my gun and think about it. So now you have an actual practice that you can actually sharpen up, and you can learn lessons along the way. You can adjust. You can communicate. Boom. Drill number seven. That was almost lightning round. Try to go kind of quick there. Last one, number eight. This is your mini drill for gas station robberies. So let's say you go somewhere like an ATM or a bank or a gas station. There's a few small things. We talked about this on the show before. A few small things you can do, and then however much you want to add into it, that's up to you. But I recommend you don't do so much tactical preparedness that you look like a fucking paranoid crazy person, but that you make smart decisions that can turn into smart tactics very quickly. Uh, really, really, really short on this. If you're driving up to a gas station or ATM or something similar, do an extra loop. Just do one loop around the building while you're paying attention in your car. So you're still in the air conditioning. It takes almost no effort. It costs you almost no money. Uh, It takes very, very little time. And it's just a smart thing to do. So you can get a better look at that building if you think something weird's going on. I would not worry so much about this in those huge commercial gas stations like your big Wawa's or Bucky's. Um, I think that's kind of a moot point. Uh, if you're seeing dozens and dozens of people filing in and out of the building and they're all happy or at least not moderately depressed, um, not such a big deal to circle the huge building in your car, but for a smaller gas station or a shitty gas station in an area you're not familiar with, it looks kind of run down, might be a good option. And then while you're in your car and you pull up to the gas pump or the front of the business, try and pick a spot where you can, from your car, see at least maybe the staff or maybe some customers in the building going in and out. Then as you get out of your car, as you're walking up, just try and keep your eyes on that as well. What kind of people are standing around in the area that don't fit? Are there any cars parked weird that don't fit? And is there anyone inside the building that doesn't fit? Or is there anyone missing, right? Is there nobody in the building? That would be a pretty big red flag, really big red flag, actually. 
Um, and then the variables are what type of vehicle you're in, how much gas you have, you know, what you're wearing, whether you're armed or not. Um, and then those decisions can be, you can discuss those with the people in the car. And if you are the one steering this training for you and your loved ones or for your group or for you and your partner, that could be a dis- uh, discussion as simple as, hey, it looks kind of weird in there. Uh, I'm still going to go in because I have to pee. But uh, uh, what do you think's going on in there? And what should we do if something happens? And they can go, oh, well, why don't the two of us go together? Okay, great. Or it could be, hey, I'm going to go in there. I'm just going to pee. So if I don't come out in like five minutes, I don't see anyone in that building. So if I go in and I go to the bathroom and you don't see staff in the building and no one else comes in and no one else comes out in like five minutes or so, start getting worried and, you know, either A, come save me and be armed or B, you know, (laughs) decide when you're going to call the police or what you're going to do. So that was the last one I had for you. Um, And the point isn't that you should take all these drills and you should do them. The point is, I want you to add whatever drills you want into your life that keep your tactical edge sharp, and I don't want you to change your life for the worse, right? So you don't need to put a safe vault door as your front door to your home. You don't need, um, you know, automatic lighting systems to turn on and off at the sound of an intruder, and uh, I think you get where I'm going here. Don't add so much security into your life that you don't enjoy your life. That's the nice thing about these mini drills. Pick one of them and just do one of them for the week. Right. So occasionally, every time you get your pocket knife out, if you look around and if you're in a big room by yourself, push up against the wall, chop your little feet and try and get your knife out. Boom. Lesson done. Do that a couple times for the week and then maybe pick a different drill. Uh, So I don't the point is, again, I don't want to bog you down with all of these. And the purpose isn't that you should do all of these. But I want your brain thinking about how you can sharpen that edge without a lot of time, money and investment for your energy. Okay, last wrap-up conclusions, and then we'll do some housekeeping. Especially with your family status, so who you spend most of your time with, whether it's a spouse, boyfriend, girlfriend, kids, uh, roommates, etc. These drills obviously will all have to be altered to fit into that. Also, probably the second biggest variable is where do you live and work? So uh, if you live on a big rural farm and you can't even see your neighbor's front door from your front doorstep, that's going to change the way you do these mini drills um, versus whether you live on a third floor of an, an apartment building, right? So take those things into account. Be smart. Don't be a crazy person. Uh, use smart tactics. Uh, doesn't mean walk around like a ninja ready to fight everybody you meet. It means make some smart decisions that if you have to apply combat tactics um, or emergency preparedness tactics, at least your lifestyle will already fit into that system. That's all. Okay, that is the end of the topics. So if you'd like to stick around, I would appreciate it. We've got a lot of cool house, housekeeping stuff going on. So my plugs, again, here's how you find me. The two easiest ways is Instagram, and that's at Uncensored Tactical. And then just direct to my email if you have some feedback, especially long format feedback, which is pat at utac.io. And again, that's also the shortcut for the website, utac.io in your browser. will bring you right to uncensoredtactical.com. It's under construction. Uh, we have someone working on it right now, but we're multitasking. We've got a lot of projects going on. So the website is up. It's working for the most part. We just have a lot of things we're building onto it. So bear with us. Thank you so much to everyone out there that takes time to consume our content. It really means the world to me. I have a huge passion for helping people, especially in the security world. Uh, so let's talk about some ways that hopefully I'm supporting you with this great free content. And hopefully you guys can help us out back. So if you did get some value out of this episode, which is our goal in every single episode, uh, here's some free ways that you can help us out. Like and subscribe on whatever platform you're on. Uh, Rate and review, especially if you're on Apple, iTunes, or any other podcatcher. Um, And share this episode with your friends that might also find value in this episode or this content. And then just head over to the website. I know it's under construction, but just getting traffic there really helps a lot. And we're trying to really upgrade that. Uh, If you're able and you want to bring some more value back and forth and uh, help out the show, our Patreon is out. Um, I now have a lot more time dedicated that I can give a lot more back to the Patreon community. Uh, This show uh, is a direct result of that. I did a poll last week on what topics people wanted to hear, and this was voted number one, mini tactical drills. So the Patreons get it. Uh, So for less than half a cup of coffee once a month, you can keep this content coming. It is free for everybody to listen to, uh, but it does cost quite a bit on the back end. So 
Uh, now that I have more time for Patreon people, I would love to have you guys come check us out on Patreon and just do a minimum level of support. That would be really helpful. Thank you. Uh, next, not too, not too much more expensive. The book is out. It's been out for close to a year now. Tactical Lockpicking by me, Pat Watson. Uh, the digital version is cheaper, uh, but I honestly think that because it's a text and reference book, it probably belongs on your bookshelf in paper format. Um, and a lot of people now, I mean, there's so much weird shit going on with politics, but, uh, if you want to support not one, but two small businesses in the best way you can, uh, a lot of people are trying to move away from these huge businesses and to try and support local. So if you don't want to give your money to Amazon, uh, you can buy direct from the printer, which is lulu.com, L U L U.com. Uh, they are the printers of my book and it's print on demand. So even when you order through Amazon, it's printed at Lulu and they ship it out. Uh, so honestly, if you're going through Amazon, you're basically doing it so that Lulu gets less money. <laughs> uh, and the links to that are on my website. Just click on the book tab on my website on the homepage. So that would be great if you could support us through buying the book. Our, and our next book is being edited right now. It's on bureaucracy and it's my, it's my take on that system. And I love it. I just, uh, finished another chapter today through its third edit. I'm very excited. What else do we have? The courses tab on the website. Uh, I'm going through it now. It's pretty up to date. It's like 90% up to date. Um, the biggest thing is we have a course in December. I would love to meet some more of you internet people out there. I love meeting people. I love training with them. It's a very low stress environment. Um, even when we do scenarios, it's stressful because you're on a time limit, but it's low stress as in we can talk, we can chat, we can laugh, we can have fun. Um, it is not very stuck up. It's not very corporate. It's not very sterile. It's not very boring and bland. And we do no PowerPoint. So check out the courses tab on uncensoredtactical.com. And I would love to meet some of you guys in our upcoming December course. That would be fantastic. Uh, what else do we got? Not too much more. Uh, my Tactical Lockpicking Video Master Series course will be released soon for sale to the public. Keep your eyes out. Stay tuned. Um, that's going to be really good for people that are prohibited from travel uh, through work, not giving you vacation, or through uh, still weird government restrictions for travel that are going on. Um, so that's going to help a lot, I think, and it's going to be really high value. It is not something I shot at my desk with a cell phone. It is like commercial level, really good stuff. I'm really excited for you guys to see that hopefully in about a month. Uh, and within a month, I'm going to be getting my private online tactical college set up and running. It's a very small class size. We're looking at maxing out at about 12 people. So the format roughly is three parts. It's going to be 24 seven access to our private discord with some really cool heavy hitters that are very active. Um, so we can chat, we can send videos, links, we have chat rooms, we have audio rooms. Uh, so you get access to that 24 seven and access to me and some other cool professionals. Part two, you get one live, at least hour long video session with me once a month that will probably be lock picking related or entry related or escape related. Um, and number three, I'm also going to have at least one expert a month in either the tactical or emergency preparedness world um, or survival world that will also be doing a one hour live session once a month. So it's going to be very much like a tactical college and it's going to be distance learning, but it's going to be a really cool community. So keep your eyes open for that. It's going to be a very small class size. Honestly, um, half the, half the seats are already filled up and booked. So we're going to max out at 12 students. If you want to be one of those 12, stay tuned. Okay. That's all the housekeeping until next time. Ask those hard questions, use those smart tactics and seek out Liberty in everything you do. <laughs>